Welcome back, nerdlings. Today, we're going to be talking about the domains of living organisms and the kingdoms which fall underneath those domains. So as we've learned in our previous lecture, a domain is the broadest, most inclusive taxon. Now there are three domains of living organisms. Those are archaea and eubacteria, and then eukarya. Archaea and eubacteria are unicellular, meaning one cell, prokaryotes. And if you remember, prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus, and they also lack membrane-bound organelles. They are also smaller than eukaryotic cells. The third domain is eukarya, and these are more complex and have a nucleus, as well as membrane-bound organelles. All organisms that fall under this domain are composed of eukaryotic cells. Those are much bigger than prokaryotic cells, and they're also a lot more complex. So the first domain we're going to talk about is archaea. This is also the kingdom, so it's domain archaea, and the only kingdom within archaea is the kingdom archaea. So domain archaea and kingdom archaea. Archaea are extremophiles, meaning they love extreme environments. Just like some people love extreme sports like snowboarding and skateboarding and that type of thing, archaea love extreme environments. They love really salty environments, really, really hot environments that you might find really deep down in the ocean at those hydrothermal vents, which are found at convergent or divergent boundaries, if you remember from eighth grade. They can be found in sewage plants, very acidic environments, all kinds of environments that propose really, really extreme conditions. That's where you find archaea. Again, these are prokaryotic, and they're also autotrophs, meaning they create their own food. So this is a picture of an archaean, or an archaeobacteria. This guy loves methane, and this would be found at a hydrothermal vent very deep within the ocean. The next domain we're going to talk about is domain eubacteria, which also the only kingdom in domain eubacteria is kingdom eubacteria. So some eubacteria can cause diseases, but a lot of them are actually helpful to us, and they're found in things such as yogurt, milk, butter, cheese, buttermilk, lots of the stuff that we like. Some of them do cause diseases, they can make us really sick, and for that we'd want to get an antibiotic, which could help us get better. Anti, meaning to get rid of, and biotic, life. So you bacteria are found everywhere except extreme environments. The extreme environments, we leave those to the extremophiles, which are the archaeobacteria. You bacteria play a very, very important role in ecosystems because they're the decomposers. This means that they break down dead or decaying materials and help break those elements down back so they can be used by other organisms. Commercially, they're very important in making cottage cheese, yogurt, and buttermilk. So this is a picture of a bacteria called E. coli. This is one of the harmful types of bacteria that can live in our intestine. We could get this if we eat meat that's not cooked very well. So a lot of times you might hear about outbreaks of E. coli bacteria. The next domain we're going to talk about is domain Eukarya. It's divided into various kingdoms. We have kingdom Protista, kingdom Fungi, kingdom Plantae, and kingdom Animalia. So kingdom Protista. This is kind of like the junk drawer that taxonomists put everything into that they don't really know where it belongs. So we have plant-like protists and animal-like protists and fungi-like protists. So again, junk drawer of taxonomy. Most of them are unicellular, meaning one cell, but some of them are multicellular. Some are autotrophic, meaning they produce their own food, while others are heterotrophic. Some of them are aquatic, some of them are found on the land. And again, we have animal-like, plant-like, fungi-like protists. So kingdom fungi. Fungi are multicellular except for yeast. Yeast is the only one that's single-cellular or unicellular. 
They are absorptive heterotrophs, kind of freaky, which means they digest their food outside of their body and then they absorb it. So as you can see here, we have some bracket fungus and some mushrooms. Those are all examples of fungus. So these are all also eukaryotic, meaning they're made out of eukaryotic cells. They have cell walls made of chitin, unlike plants, which have cell walls made of cellulose, which is a polysaccharide, meaning that they are composed of many, many sugars. Which brings us to kingdom plantae. So plants are multicellular, they are autotrophic, which means they get their energy from the sunlight and they produce sugars in the form of carbohydrates. They have cell walls made of cellulose. So make sure you guys remember, plant cell walls are made of cellulose, but fungi cell walls are made of chitin. Animal kingdom, or kingdom animalia. This is where we belong. So animals are multicellular, they are ingestive heterotrophs, meaning we ingest our food. We consume it, digest it inside of our bodies, unlike the freaky fungus that absorbs its food and breaks it down outside. So animals feed on plants or other animals. So right here is a breakdown of all of the kingdoms within the domain eukarya, meaning everything that's made out of eukaryotic cells. So first of all, we have protists. They are complex single cells. Some of them are multicellular. They can absorb their food. Some of them can photosynthesize, and some of them ingest their food. Examples of protists are the paramecium, the euglenoid, slime molds, and dinoflagellates. Our next kingdom within the domain Eukarya is fungi. Some of them are unicellular like the yeasts, but all of the other ones are multicellular. They're filamentous, which means they have these little hair-like furry projections. And those form with specialized cells. They absorb their food. Remember, they're absorptive heterotrophs. They cannot produce their own food. And they also play a very important role in decomposing organisms that have died. Examples of fungus are our black bread mold, yeast, mushrooms, and bracket fungus. Plantae is our next kingdom within the domain Eukarya. Plants are multicellular and they form with specialized complex cells. They photosynthesize, meaning that they are autotrophs and they produce their own food mosses, ferns, different types of trees and flowers. Those are all examples of plants. And then animalia, the last kingdom within the domain of Eukarya. Animals are multicellular and they form specialized complex cells, such as nerve cells, skin cells, heart cells, blood cells, and many others. They ingest their food. We are ingestive heterotrophs. Corals are animals. I know that sounds weird. Sponges are actual animals. Jellyfish, earthworms, blue jays, squirrels. So all invertebrates, starfish, sea anemones. We have fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, insects, all the different bugs, bats. All of those are classified as animals. Most genera contain a number of similar species. The genus Homo, which is where we're found, is actually the only exception, and it only contains modern humans. So Homo sapiens, sapiens is the species name, and Homo is the genus, but we are the only species found within that genus name. And classification is based on evolutionary relationships. So the basis for modern taxonomy is based off of many things, one of those things being homologous structures. This means that we have the same structure, but a different function. If you remember, homologous structures share a common evolutionary ancestor. We may have adapted in different ways, but we share that common ancestor. We have similar embryological development. We have very similar molecular biology in our DNA, RNA, and amino acid sequences that compose our proteins. 
So if you remember from evolution, this is an example of homologous structures. The forearm of a human versus the forearm of a cheetah, the forearm of a whale, and a bat. We all have the same bones, which means we all have some common ancestor, but we adapt it to the different environments that we live in. Humans adapted for gripping, cheetahs are adapted for speed, whales have adapted for their aquatic environment, and bats have adapted the ability to fly. So here's an example of similarities in our vertebrate embryos. So all of us start off looking like this weird, slimy, alien fish thing, but as we progress in our development, we all develop into different vertebrates. So this is the evolutionary or the embryological development, I should say, of a fish. This is us. We still actually have a postanal tail and gills, which disappear whenever we're developing as a fetus. And eventually, we're born. This is an example of a pig, a chicken, and a turtle. So cladograms we learned a little bit about during our evolution unit. So cladograms are diagrams that show how organisms are related based on shared derived characteristics like feathers, hair, or scales. So looking at this right here, you see a vertebral column. Any line that comes after a vertebral column means that that organism is going to have a backbone or a vertebrae. So our lamprey is going to have a vertebral column, the grouper is going to have a vertebral column, so is the salamander, the turtle, and the wolf. The lancelet, however, is not. So if you look at jaw bones, and I said, what organisms lack jaw bones, meaning they don't have them? You should tell me that the lamprey and the lancelet do not have jaw bones. The grouper, the salamander, the turtle, and the wolf have jaw bones. So if I went to amniotic eggs, the only two organisms that have amniotic eggs are the turtle right here and the wolf right here. And then the last little thing on our cladogram is hair. The only organism that comes after this would be the wolf. So the wolf is the only organism that has hair. Here's another example of a cladogram. This is a primate cladogram showing different characteristics that primates have had. So for example, if I said loss of a tail, the only primate that has loss of a tail would be the human and the chimpanzee. If I said loss of an opposable thumb on the foot, the only organism that has the loss of an opposable thumb on our foot, even though it would be really cool, are humans. The last thing we're going to talk about dealing with taxonomy is called a dichotomous key. Dichotomous keys are used to identify organisms' characteristics and they're given in pairs. You read both characteristics and either go to another set of characteristics or you can identify the organism. So this is an example of a dichotomous key. If I wanted to say key out this octopus here, but I didn't know that it was an octopus, I'd go to 1A right here and it says tentacles present and 1B says tentacles absent. If I look at it, I see that the tentacles are present. So tentacles are present, I go to two. Eight tentacles, it's an octopus. If it has more than eight tentacles, then I have to go to three. Well, it has eight tentacles, so that means it's an octopus. So this concludes our taxonomy lecture. I hope you learned a lot, and I will see you guys soon.